think it's working. It says I'm live. Hopefully it is. Let me just find my way around the screen. Um, how's everyone doing? Thank you for coming. Um, I apologise in advance if we're interrupted because literally as I pressed the live button, my kid came running in and was like, can I have some snacks? So um, such is life on a live Q&A, but hopefully um, I've warned them not to interrupt me again. Um, so I think I can see people joining. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm just going to jibber-jabber for a moment to give everyone a moment to join. Um, if someone can like message to say hello. Ah, Lauren, thank you. I was going to say, I know the comments will pop up when someone makes a comment, but I can never remember where they are. Um, so hello. Hi Lauren, hi Karen. Okay, cool. Thanks for coming. Um, oh, hi Hannah. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions and only half an hour to get to get them through them. Um, so I've tried to sort of amalgamate a few because a few of them were covering the same issue, which was essentially uh, multi-cat households, introductions, um, how to manage those sorts of things basically. So um, I, I was going to read out one of the questions and then um, hopefully that will cover a few in one. Um, and then I have a question on attention seeking overnight, which is a problem for a lot of people, so that would be a nice one. Um, and a little bit on separation anxiety, and then one question which was just everything about aggression. <laughs> so any time we have left, I will fill with aggression stuff. Um, so if I read you one of the questions I had, and we'll start there. Um, Karen, it's your question, so I'm glad you made it. And um, so it's, how can I introduce two resident sister cats, both just over two years old, to a newcomer? Um, so a cat we think is around three years old, who's lived in the garden for two years. Um, a little bit of context, the new cat is lovely on her own, very affectionate, but it's not, it's not going well trying to introduce them. She chases them off at any opportunity. Um, we've had the new cat since April, and we've tried scent swapping and sight swapping, very good. <laughs> but the new cat seems to get very distressed by this and wheeze in various places. Uh, she has her own space upstairs, so it just feels easier to keep them separate at the moment, but I know it's not ideal. Um, and so, so many people are in the same boat in terms of just thinking I've got no other option other than to keep them separate. Uh, and it sort of takes over your life, having to manage that logistically and sliding in and out of the rooms, making sure the cats don't dart through your legs and trying to spend time with each side equally. And yeah, it's definitely a big problem. So, um, I if, so it's true tricky when we do Q&A's because I obviously have a thousand questions, especially in terms of the new cat and, and what her history is and what is she, like is she settled in the new house? Is she is she an indoor cat or is she firmly an outdoor cat? Because I'm wondering how much time she gets out there and whether that's actually bothering her that she's found herself, okay she probably wasn't having a great time outside and that she was obviously having to um, find her own food and she may not have had anywhere warm and comfortable to sleep which is very sad but she may not be very settled suddenly finding herself totally inside so i would have a think about what other stressors might be impacting on the new cat but likewise the other two um because if there was any other um any external factors that might be impacting on their mental well-being or just how happy they are that's gonna um, impact how open they are to share in the house with other cats um it's just something that when we do introductions we need all three cats to be in a good mood because if they're stressed for any reason then that is not going to it's not going to bode well basically um i see you've commented to see she's very settled okay cool um so all three indoor cats ah, okay so that's interesting i wonder um it's nice that she has adapted so well hopefully she was just looking for yeah a warm bed and somewhere comfortable to to stay in some reliable food um, so that makes it a little bit easier if they're all three indoor because now you have your environment, you don't have to manage one of them coming in and out or um, them accidentally bumping into each other in the garden and things. So sight swapping and scent swapping is okay, but I would just, so if you're saying it's stressing them out, I would just do like a little bit of trialing with that. So if you were, were to, um, I'm not sure how you've done it so far, but scent swapping, you could use, um, you could either swap their bedding so if you notice your cats like to sleep on the bed or sleep on the sofa, just lay a blanket where they normally sleep and then when they slept on it, that then becomes a nice little scent marker, um, like a portable set type territory marker, which is amazing, because then you can swap them. So obviously we don't want to take away their beds and be like, we can't have that anymore because it's going into the other cat's space. Um, it's just the blankets. 
So try that. And some people, because when you read online about scent swapping, it's like rub your cat with a towel and then go and rub that on the other cat. And then, so some people get the wrong sort of idea about that. And then and they say to me, you know, oh, I, I tried to rub my cat and they didn't like it, which obviously they don't like it. So I'm not sure how you work, you're managing that so far, but if it's possible to take a step back from that and do it in a little bit more of a less invasive way, if this is relevant to you. Um, so get those blankets that they've been sleeping on and just place them in the environment and just let the other cat interact with that in their own time. So there's no need to go over and be like, here's the smell, what do you think? Um, you can just leave it there and then the other cat can be like, hmm, okay, now that's in my environment um, and and can do what they want with that. So, But I would also watch how they interact with that, with that um, scent marker. So if you notice they go over and hiss at it, then that's obviously not a great sign. Um, if they sleep on it, that's, that's a really good sign. So um, this can be quite indicative of how future meetings are gonna go because you can sort of see their mindset a little bit. Whereas some cats are like, absolutely no, I'm not sharing my territory with anyone else, even the smell of another cat. Whereas others are like, mm, okay, we've got the smell, what next? This sort of can pave the way a little bit. Um, site swapping is good as well. Like I know you put that in your message. It can be a little bit of a logistical issue as well, trying to get like, how do you, swap them around without them seeing each other and there's a lot of carrying around and ushering here and there so that can sometimes be a bit tricky um, but if you have the facility to be able to do that so if you've got your if your new cat has one bedroom then maybe put them into another bedroom and then you can let uh, your first two cats go in and explore um, and then likewise you could you can swap around to let your new cat go and explore downstairs um, that's good because it allows them to do their own scent marking so they might rub their faces on door frames or um, the dining table legs or whatever it might be and if they settle down in these areas then when they sleep on things then they're going to be leaving their scent behind so just sort of hinting to them that there are three cats here now and this is what we're going to be doing we're going to be sharing um, but it's in a totally no pressure situation because they're not having to see the other cat at the moment so um, so that's normally the first step but um, if she if it's this is upsetting her and she's weeing um, it's not looking very positive and I don't know why she's waiting about that. I don't know if it's, you know, if it's something to do with the management or maybe she's waiting for another reason. It's hard to tell sometimes. Um, but we are looking for either like a neutral response to this sort of thing or good. So obviously if she is peeing then it's not great. Um, I would ask if she's squatting or spraying the wee because that would tell me whether or not if it's a territorial thing she's more likely to be spraying it. Um, if she's squatting it, it might be more of a stress thing or more of like a logistics thing, like I can't use the tray or I'm worried about using the tray. Um, this is why behaviour consultations take like two hours because there's a million questions that, um, that impact on how to answer. Um, but presume, let's presume that you've gone through all that and then it's fine. Um, then we come on to the physical meetings. So this is where it'd be relevant for a lot of the other questions as well because it, some of the other questions were like, I've got uh, just introduced a new cat and then one of them is like obsessed with the others and is constantly chasing. Um, oh, sorry, my dog's being so noisy. Um, and uh, there's tension or there's problems when they get them together and they do like the actual meetings. So what I would say about that for everybody is that when you very first start the meetings, um, ideally we want to be using a barrier at first because it just gives you that extra level of control. So you can know 100% that one cat isn't going to chase the other one, there's not going to be any fighting because there's barriers in between. Um, so you can do that with a baby gate or a pet gate, they work pretty well. Um, it that can take some logistical planning again because some cats will jump over them, some cats might slip through them if it's um, like a normal stair gate. So you have to, and I've had people that have built like fancy um, structures that go over the doors. Um, or oh, I have been using lately um, just like dust door blockers, I don't know if you know what I mean. But on Amazon if you just type in like dust, I don't even know what I would type in. It's basically like a mesh screen on the door that has a zip down the middle and like builders use it if they're doing work in the kitchen or whatever to stop the dust going into the rest of the house. So that makes more sense. I don't know what I would call that, but that I hopefully I've explained that well. But these are obviously work really well for meetings because um, you can just unzip it and walk through and then it's like a mesh screen that's up 24 seven. Um, so if, so as your cat is peeing, even with the scent swapping, I would go very carefully at this stage because you know that your cat is not very, um, 
not very keen on the idea of sharing the house with other two other cats. So, um, whereas if you had a brand new cat, you might be able to afford to just put that um, door frame, doorway up and then let them sort of interact on either side. Well, uh, you would probably need to bit, move a bit more slowly and just be a bit more careful here because if they suddenly meet like this at the door, even though there's a little mesh barrier in between, it's probably not going to go well. And if there's any hissing, then we're sort of not doing any good, we're not making any progress. Um, so what we want to do then is the meetings need to be less pressure. So we need to move them away from the barrier. So when I talk about less pressure, I always say, so it's distance and distractions. Those are the two ways of reducing the pressure and making it easier for your cat to be in that situation and for it to go, up, go actually go well. I can hear someone coming. You okay? Can you go away, please? <laughs> we'll sit down here. Um, so, where was I? So yeah, so if you're, um, so if you're worried it's not going well, then move them away from the doors using treats or toys, so some distraction, and get them as far apart as you can. So if you've got, if you're using like a bedroom doorway, then just be on the other side of the, the bedroom, and then you might, on the other side, there might be a hallway, so you could go down the other end of the hallway. Obviously, this is totally dependent on the logistics of the house. Um, but as far apart as you can get, we'll just ease that pressure, because they might be like, okay, that cat is five metres away, and that's fine, I'm okay with that. Um, and that's where we need to start, because if we're 30 centimetres apart with a barrier in between, then they might be like, no, this is too much. And this is where you'll get hissing and potential, like, no aggression because the, um, the barrier will be there. But you can't really build on this because everyone's in a mood, everyone's in a, a negative emotional state. Like, I don't like that cat, I don't like that cat, or one of them might be feeling that way. So um, we need both cats to be in a positive emotional state. That's like the crux of it. And so if it's not working, you can be like, what? can I do here to help my cat feel happier? And it might be dreamies, it might be licky licks, or it might be moving away from the barrier. Um, and I always think once you've got that, once you know, okay, they can do it at either end of the, the hallway, that's working okay, then have that in your mind, like that's the line. Um, and then you can start bringing them together a bit, because I know that everyone tries to get them to this point where we don't wanna to get to that point ever, that's not our end game, because no cat is happy being this close, it's too, it's too close for any cat. So we're looking to be like about a metre apart, or two metres apart maybe, maybe a metre and a half, but still close, but not too close um, during the meetings. Um, I don't know if this is making sense. So, so yeah, basically very, very, very short meetings as well, maybe just like two minutes. Be like, there's that other cat, you've got some treats, they're not bothering you, you're not bothering them, two minutes, done. Because what tends to happen is you'll get them together, work with a barrier or no barrier, and it'll be fine for like 10 minutes, and then there'll be a squabble, or there'll be a chase, or there'll be a hiss. And then it's like, ah, every time I get them together, it always ends in some sort of tension. Um, but you've had 10 minutes of good. So what we need to make sure is that um, every single meeting is ending well, because what, what tends to happen when I move in to, I say move in, when I, when I come in to help someone, is they've been doing this, but every single meeting has ended badly because they've got them together until the moment where it goes wrong. So what the cats are learning now is that, um, well, yeah, I can be with you for a bit, but it is definitely going to end bad. So that they have, they build up this expectation of like, well, you are going to chase me, or you are going to hiss me. And then that's not a great mindset to be in. Like, they're not going to make friends with that mindset because they don't trust each other. So, um, so if we can get a whole bunch of two-minute meetings all under our belt where they've all gone well, and there's been no tension because it's only been two minutes and because you've had your dreamies there, and you might feel like, well, this is pointless because they haven't had the opportunity to go and fight each other and they're only not fighting because I've got dreamies and because we're so far away. But once you've got that huge foundation under your belt, or their belt, that's when you can start to move on. You can be like, okay, so you've done all these meetings and now what, what if we take the barrier down? What if we move a little bit closer? And what if we don't have so many trees? Then what? Um, and because you've put on all this hard work already, fingers crossed, you should find that... Um, it goes much better and it's not just a case of sitting still and being like when are you going to chase me when are you going to chase me it's more like oh okay well yeah you do what you want to do and i'll do what i want to do um which is what we want them to do really we're aiming for them to ignore each other not to um to be best friends because if we aim for them to be best friends we'll be disappointed because it's quite rare even for cats that um even for siblings really most of the time well some of the time it works out perfectly well but for a lot of cats, once they reach adulthood, they're like, eh, you can just keep to yourself and I'll keep to myself. So that's what we're aiming for because that's more realistic. Um, 
Uh, I don't want to go into this in too I feel like I'm taking up all the time with this, but um, from there, basically, what I would say is we, from, from the meetings being really, really controlled, then you just want to add in a little bit of freedom. So you just you might have your licky licks and give them a little bit and then um, leave it like a minute and see what they do. Do they go off and sit on the catch tree? Because if they do, that's amazing. You can carry this on. If they're watching each other and eyeing each other and they're walking around and they're not really doing much other than looking at each other, then that's when we still need to carry on with this really controlled, like, let's stop it here because we can foresee what's going to happen. Um, and the moment they've settled, then you're pretty much there. And that's what I tend to say to most people, like, do your meetings in the evenings when you can just sit in front of the TV. And so you can do, like, five minutes of um, treats and cats together, um, opposite ends of the same room, your barriers down by this point. Um, and then when one settles, then you can just have a normal evening and just keeping an eye on them to make sure that nothing's really you know they're not going to um, bother each other um, but it's just gradually getting them together and gradually getting them getting used to the idea of sharing the territory I always feel like you're sort of tricking them into it I know that sounds really horrible but it's like just like gradually easing them together without them even really noticing rather than plonking a cat in and being like okay off you go how's this going to go because sometimes it just goes terribly oh I'm sorry that was such like a loads of information in such a short amount of time um i can answer any of these questions afterwards if you have questions on what i'm saying um let me just scan the comments to make sure i've not missed anything um oh that's a new question about a new cat that would like uh why would a two-year-old male cat leave home to live wild in a nearby area we'll, we'll cover that in a minute because that's a really interesting question um hannah yes like a fly screen that is yes google fly screen and it might come up um okay okay that's fine uh, so hopefully i've not missed anything because i know hopefully that i've covered a few different questions um but introductions um here's a little shameless plug i have a chapter of in um chapter on introductions in my book that's coming out in november um so that should at least it's written down then and you can literally follow it step by step um but yeah it kind of just basically covers what i've said in a more coherent way and more detail um okay so another question i have two new to sisters just over a year old and they're quite nervous and shy so we've had them for about a year now and think they've probably had a bit of a rough start to their lives and it's impacted them a lot the main problem we're having is with mooj she seems to get quite anxious at night and tends to come and wake me up for snuggles a few times each night oh i have the exact same problem for my cat um Initially, we kept them out of the bedroom um, to try to get them used to that, but they just scratched at the carpet and the door, which, I, yeah, that's so common. Um, but it's gotten to a point now where I haven't had a full night's sleep since February, which, God, you're not alone, the amount of people that have the same problem. Um, so there's two things um, to bear in mind with, with this sort of problem. Number one is the initial reason why she first started. Um, so let's think about that. So it could be, you know, she's more on the shy side. So is there anything in the environment that's bothering her? Is it that she just doesn't want to um, be on her own or with her sister? She wants your company. She wants you for reassurance. Is there anything outside that's bothering her? Sometimes it can be like what they can see through the window. You might have more cats in the garden at night or you might have wildlife that's coming about. So have a scout around to see if there's anything that might be potentially bothering her. But because we're already quite a few months down the line, what probably, so that first thing might have gone. It might have been that you had a new cat in the area and now that cat's gone, it's not a problem, but she's learnt now that she can wake you up and she can get snuggles. And yes, that's me because I love it because my cat will come over at three o'clock in the morning and be like, mm, can I get in? And I'm like, yeah, come and get in. Um, oh, I don't, I can miss half an hour sleep. That's totally fine. Um, so I've set that up myself, which is not great. But um, so she, she knows she can wake you up and so she's just, Oh, I don't want to say taking advantage because I don't mean that in a bad way but she they're opportunistic and they learn quickly they are clever so um, basically we need to make sure she's got everything she needs overnight she's not in need of she's not wanting anything so I'm not sure how you feed them but if you free feed make sure that there's some food overnight if she has meal times then perhaps give her a little bit just before bed to make sure she's not hungry um, you might want to play with her before bed to make sure she's not um, full of energy i know you've tried all this because everybody has by the time we get to this point where they're like ah, i'm losing my hair um so try that and then what else are we going to say uh, make sure it's got somewhere warm to sleep so she's not like oh i want to get into bed with you like mine um 
so all those boxes are ticked and then you just have to hunker down and not reinforce the behavior so um i know it sounds really like uh what's the word primitive but to just cover your head and be like ah i'm not just going to engage because that she will quickly learn that um uh, it's not working anymore and she can't wake you up but you have to be you have to not give her any attention for those those two weeks i would say give it two weeks and then see where you are at the end but one thing to bear in mind is it always, always gets worse before it gets better. So um, this is what most people say as well. I've tried it and it didn't work. She got more, more like um, intensive in her behavior. Like she was clawing at me. She was trying to get me out from under the covers or trying to pour at my face to wake me up. And I know that is what's going to happen. But you have to ride that out because she has, it's like, um, what's the analogy they often use? Like, um, if you put some money in a vending machine and your thing gets stuck and you can't get it out and then you'll shake it and be like oh come on you were supposed to give me that you have every other time i've put a pound in and then eventually you'll be like well it's stuck it's not coming out and then you'll go so it's that same process but it can take some time um so give it two weeks if you can of keep her inside make sure keep, keep her in the bedroom like don't close her out because yes your carpets will play the price um, make sure all her needs are met and then just be strong as you can like hunker down don't give her any attention like if you have to pick her up and put her on the floor but don't do what I do which is like oh but it's, I, I love that you can't wake me up come and get in come and snuggle down um, because he will do it every night which he does um, but I don't mind it's fine <laughs> okay hopefully that's helpful um, let's just scan the comments again thank you Okay, let me just cover the questions that I've got here because there are a couple more in the um, comments now. Um, so separation anxiety, um, I've just written here separation anxiety, I've forgotten the actual specific question itself. Um, I think it was like, what's your thoughts and how do we treat it and is it a thing? Um, so my experience with separation anxiety is, like when you say separation anxiety, you have an image of like a cat that's sat in the house that's like, I'm lonely, I'm, I'm anxious because I miss you and I want you to come back. And there may be a little bit of that in that we now have changed the social behaviour of cats, like they're not as independent as they used to be. They do have a relationship with us and sometimes that relationship is very, very intensive, especially if they're indoor cats because they don't really have that independent side to their day, where even cats that have indoor and out, outdoor access, yes, they're when they're indoors, they could have that really strong bond with you. Um, and hopefully do, but when they're outside, they still have all that independent stuff where they can go off and do their own thing that you don't even know about. Um, so if we're going to keep them in, then we are sort of setting them up for this sort of issue because this is their world. Inside this one house is every their everything. So yes, if you're gone for a long period, then um, that, that could potentially um, lead them to be anxious. Although I don't know much research on it, so I might not even be right. But what I tend to find as well is that there's normally other issues with this as well. So um, sometimes it can be that they're worried about something else in the environment, i.e. cats outside or another cat that they actually live with, um, but you are a source of reassurance for them and you manage that. So you might shoo the other cats away, you might separate the two of them if they're, um, or like stop them fighting if you're having that issue inside. But and then when you're gone, suddenly these other issues are like you're not they're not safe from them anymore and they don't feel like they're safe from them anymore so that's where the anxiety might come in so it may not be that they're anxious about you being gone it's more that i can cope with these sources of stress when you're here but i can't cope when you're gone so that's a whole other issue of like we obviously have to deal with the original source of stress and keep that under control where we can so it can take a bit of detective work to figure out what that might be um, and then obviously boredom is something like if you're at work all day, nine to five, and your cat's just at home, uh, especially if it's a single cat, then they might get bored and they might be destructive and knock things down and jump on top of the mantelpiece and you might find a bit of a disaster when you come home. But um, I guess that's pretty self-explanatory, like if they, they need something to do um, and they are opportunistic. So they will, if it's there, they will do it. Like they will jump on the kitchen side or they will climb up something to explore it and just find in their own fun. Um, so if you're thinking about getting a cat, get two, <laughs> especially if it's a kitten, because they can play together. Um, or you could think about safe outside access, like if you're in a safe area, then you could consider letting them out or um, you can get a catio or 
cat-proof fencing or whatever it is, but definitely having outside access definitely helps with separation anxiety because, like I say, that's their like little independent world where they can go out and do all that, and that will tick a lot of boxes in terms of keep, keeping them stimulated, um, and obviously them not being so reliant on you to deal with these potential sources of stress. Also gives them an opportunity to get away from stressful events, like if if it's two cats that don't get along then um, one of them can go out and they can time share that and then it just helps them manage that a bit better. But that's an issue for another day. No one's asked me about that today, so that's good. Because uh, I could talk about that all night. Um, okay, let's see. The other questions in here were, so why would a two-year-old male cat leave home to live, in, live wild in a nearby area? What can cause that? So I would ask the question of what is that cat's history because a lot of the time these cats or there are a lot of cats that are typically feral or street cats or they've, they've just been used to living um, an independent life and that could be like they might have had experience of that so they might have, um, I always think of that cat that was rescued, rescued by the football team from Qatar, I'm sure it was Qatar, I might have that wrong. And they bought the cat back from Qatar and it was in quarantine for all those months. And now it's just living in England, I think. I'm going to have some update. But that cat is going to struggle if it's going to live in like an indoor, indoor as an indoor cat or something like that. Because um, it's it was so used to living that free outside life and it's such a difference to make them do that. Um, and I've had a lot of kittens born of like feral cats or street cats that also struggle to adapt to an indoor life. So, um, so if your cat or if this male cat that you're talking about is has a history of roaming or is descended from cats that were free and they weren't pet cats, then it might just be sort of ingrained that that's what they do. Especially if they were born out on the on the streets or wherever they or in the wild, basically. Um, so that can cause it. Obviously, there's other rewards. So um, hunting. If there's lots of hunting opportunities, which I expect there probably is, if it's a wild area. Um, then that's essentially rewarding him for going over there. And if his home is quite stressful or if there are stresses there, then it can just be a way of him getting some escape um, and just having a bit of peace and quiet or just to get away from those stresses. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Getting him to stay home is a different, a whole different ball game. <laughs> um, see this question here. One of my cats is eating clothing. She does this especially if the shirt is perfumed or dirty. Might be out of about the strong smell, but not all the time. She has no health problems, eats really good. She's done this since she was a baby and was sucking blankets as if it was milk. Um, have you heard about this before? Why would she do it? Doesn't bother me. So if she's eating stuff, um, I'd just speak to the vet. I know you've probably done that already. Um, but I'd just be worried about her potentially ingesting stuff. If, she, if it's just she's sucking on things, then um, it's... I wonder if she's done it as a kitten because there are lots of kittens that if they've been weaned early then they might carry on this behaviour. Um, but it's basically to do with, um, it's just reminiscent of when they were kittens and when they would suckle from the mum there. Um, and there's so many cats that do it on, well, I think so, I'm not sure if we're talking about the same thing or not. Um, but I've come across so many cats that suck on different body parts like earlobes and fingers and just like um, sometimes eyelid. Um, was the worst one because it was so bruised the way the kitten was like suckling on there um, but it does seem to be a little bit of a hangover but I would um, it can be stress relief as well so I would have a think about if she is experiencing any sort of stress or whether it's just something she's always done and it's, it's just become, become a bit of a habit now um, and if it's not a problem then then I wouldn't worry about it but obviously if she is, if she is ingesting things then we might need to think about that in a bit more detail. I wonder if she's a Siamese. It's very common in Siamese cats. Um, so it was just a random thought. <laughs> um, okay, so Sally has asked, I have brothers. One starts to beat up on the other if he's hungry. He's prone to weight gain, so often wants feeding more than I can give him. Anything else other than trying to split up when he's hungry and activity feeding to make it last longer? Do you know, it's interesting you said that because this comes up so many times because a lot of people will feed their cats um, morning and evening, just breakfast and dinner. And it's always that hour before breakfast or the hour before dinner that they'll say, oh yeah, that's when this problem's, like the aggression between cats, this is when that's um, quite, well, it's the worst part of the day, basically. So it does 
fit into that hangry sort of mindset, doesn't it? But um, I would just, so I would speak to the vet to see if there's a diet you can feed that's more filling, but isn't um, more, like it has less calories. I don't know if that's a thing, but it's definitely worth exploring. If it's just that he just needs to eat more, you might find you can find a lower calorie food that he can now have more of. Um, definitely split meals up if you're not already to make sure that he's not, there's not long periods going past when he is hungry. Um, and then, yes, you could hear about activity feeding. So activity feeding is useful, obviously, for stimulation, but also to make the food last longer so that he's spending a lot of time eating and not just wolfing it down. Um, anything else? So it's tricky to know because I would like to know about their relationship generally because I wonder if there's changes you can make elsewhere that would also help this specific scenario. Um, so what I probably should have said earlier actually when we talk about introducing is making sure the environment is set up right for, for your cat household. So if you have two cats then um, we just want to make sure that there's plenty of everything to go around and if you notice that they are fighting over the top of the cat tree or um, there's tension around the litter trays and like around the resources and the things they're using then you might want to throw in a few extra ones in different places so you can sort of ease the pressure on those important bits and help them spread out a little bit more and um, just separate so um, so yeah and I would think about I wonder how they're being fed as well if they're being fed together in that they both have their meal times at the same time then um, that can just be a very tense situation because they just come running down for food and then it can um, they don't necessarily want to be together but they have to be because that's where the food is so I would if they're not already I would try keeping them separate um, ideally in separate rooms with the door shut because otherwise one will just run off and get the other one um, okay hopefully that's helpful what's this question here so Claire I have three new to male cats one is 15 and goes out two nearly five and have always been indoor we used to get up get on until last summer when we had a 14 year old niece and then four year old nephew to stay for a week Oh, I wonder if this, I think this is the same question that I had earlier. Um, let me just read through it. Um, so Harrison, the 15 year old outdoor cat, growls and hisses at Austin and Morris, the five year old indoor cat, and Austin will swat and lunge at Harrison. Harrison rarely comes in apart from to eat, as he's fearful of Austin and Morris, and I'm constantly on tenterhooks as the tension between the cats is awful. Can you offer any advice? Um, so yeah, so basically this is what I was trying to cover earlier, which I don't know if I was, but um, so your cat's are already sharing the environment, so presumably you're not doing meetings, but what I would say is it might be worth adding some meetings in, in that we, like I was saying, we don't want every single meet, um, time you interact to go wrong, we don't want them to be chased all the time, and to be growling and hissing, and like bobbing at each other, and slinking past each other because they're scared that they're going to get chased. So um, I would introduce sometimes where they spend a few minutes together having treats at separate ends of the room and it's just calm and it's just nice because then um, you're sort of skewing the, ba the balance a little bit more. Uh, so it's not all bad, there are some good times thrown in there as well. You just see if you can get them uh, snowballing in the right direction. Um, and, all, and definitely in this situation, think about your environmental setup. So yes, the resources are important, but what about um, the way outside? So, like, can Harrison get in without being chased? Has he got a safe route in? If he hasn't, so if there's one cat flap and Morris is sat in front of it or Austin sat inside, then you might need an another one. And I don't know if that's, for a lot of people, that's not doable, but for some, you could put a cat flap in the front door or you could put, um, leave the window open. Uh, they could hop up onto the conservatory roof and then inside, like, whatever works for you. If you can find an extra way into the house, then you will relieve some of that pressure around the cat flap. Um, but yeah, it, this sounds like a very serious issue, so I'm sorry if it's not really enough information to be very helpful, but those are the first things that I would tick off. Okay, um, I realise we've gone over already. However, um, I'm sure it was Rachel who, who said to talk about aggression, and she was the first person to ask a question, and I've left it till last, so I'm still just going to go over and talk about aggression. Um, so I'm going to talk about people-directed aggression because um, I've covered a load of aggression already. Um, and I don't know what you specifically wanted to know, Rachel, but um, one thing, right, what would I most like to tell you about aggression? The most thing is think about what your cat is learning from the aggression that they're showing. So it's sort of the same as the attention seeking thing. There will be a, an initial reason why they're aggressive, and that might be a totally reasonable reason, like you might have stolen their tail or 
a kid might have been prodding them or um, you could have been stroking them for too long and they got overstimulated and were then aggressive, like whatever reason it might be. But how you react to that um, is going to be, well, going to have a massive impact on how things then go on and how things like whether it's going to improve or get worse. So loads of people, and it's so annoying, um, will hit out at them or push them away at least and not try to be horrible, but will just go, ah, you know, you scratch me, get off, like get off my lap and push them off. Um, in which case the cat then starts to become fearful of that person um, and then obviously um, the aggression is going to get much worse because now they're worried that oh you might hurt me so the, the aggression becomes much more defensive and becomes out of a, from a fearful face rather than just I've had enough of this stroking will you stop please so at this point then you've got a very complicated problem on your hands because your cat needs to unlearn what they've already learned and you see you need to set up new associations and start rebonding with this cat um, and handling the aggression in a much different way. Um, and I've had so, so many cats where I'm thinking, if you just, at the very first time, handled that differently, you, you wouldn't have this problem on your hand at all. Um, so cats that have learned to be aggressive, they don't normally show warnings. So when, you, um, when people say, my cat attacks out of nowhere, then my automatic thought is, okay, there's a lot to unpick here because this cat has learned that the warnings don't work. There's no point hissing. There's no point switching the tail and waiting for years to go back because I've done all that before and you didn't listen and so I had to bite you and that finally worked. So now you can bit me. Um, so, so that's definitely something I would just keep on the radar if you're, if you're dealing with an aggressive cat. Um, what else can I say about aggression? Um, I think it's important to think about the underlying reason for the aggression. So yes, petting aggression is really common and it's normally because the cat doesn't like being picked up but someone picked them up um, or straight for too long or the cat wants to be on your lap but not be stroked um, and it's just a difference in what they, like a mismatch in what you want but they, and what they want. Um, but also if you're experiencing like, your cat chasing your ankles when you go to the loo in the night or like, jumping up from the floor like onto you, then these, this sort of aggression is more to do with predatory behaviour and like, misdirected play. So they want to chase something, they want to grab onto something, um, but it's not because they're being aggressive, like they're not necessarily in a, in a mood about it or in a bad emotional state, they just want to play. And cats, that when they want to play, they're stimulated by movement. So if you're walking, then your ankles are fun to chase. Um, and they love to do that thing, which I'm sure we've all done, um, where they like grab onto your arm and then bunny kick with their back feet. Um, that's a typic, typical like typical play behaviour, but also if you try to grab their tummy, that's what they'll do as well. Um, so if you're seeing these sorts of behaviours where it's quite active, there's quite a lot of chasing, running, pouncing, grabbing, this is a sign that your cat needs more in terms of stimulation. Um, and yeah, just lots and lots of playtime and it, if you, but they can get into that as a habit as well. So just bear in mind that if you notice them going to like stalk mode, that you've got something to hand that you can use to quickly redirect them, like a wand toy or some ping pong balls, that you can go go and chase that instead, and then sort of get them out of the habit. Um, I'm gonna leave that there on aggression. I don't know if, if you had any more specific problem, um, questions. If you did, then let me know. Um, but I've just noted another question pop up. So let's make this the last one, and then I'll leave you to your evenings. Um, so it's from, from Karen again, who had the question at the beginning. Could I just ask quickly, one of my two resident cats is so nervous of the new cat, I can't even get her in the vicinity of the new cat. How can I encourage her into the space? Don't worry if you don't, don't have time. So obviously I don't know anything about your situation, so please don't think I'm being dismissive or um, judgy or anything like that. But I wonder if your cat is su suited to living in a multi-cat household with this new cat. Um, and I know that's horrible to hear, and I don't mean that's actually true, because obviously I don't know, but just based on what you said, um, it's so important to find the right matches, and a lot of problems that people have is that they've, put, they've picked two different cats that just aren't compatible, so like for example, um, so if I work with someone that's cat is always fighting with the other cats outside, fighting all the time, they've never had a friendly cat or an interaction with a friendly cat ever, and then they get a new cat in the house, and I think, ah, you knew that was going to happen <laughs> because you've basically taken one of the cats from outside, essentially, and brought it into your cat's territory. So, um, and likewise, if you've got a super shy cat that um, that doesn't really, like, it's not confident and isn't very sociable in that sort of way and, like, always runs away from the other cats, 
then if you are going to get a new cat, then you need one of a similar temperament because you don't want a super confident cat that's going to go running over and be like, let's be friends, because the shy one's going to be like, no, 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 I don't want that. So, um, so obviously you haven't had that opportunity to pick the cats because as circumstances are, as they normally are with cats, one cat has just presented itself after living in a garden for two years. Um, then, um, so we don't often have the luxury of picking temperaments to go like as a compatible match. But sometimes the match can, it can be like the opposite. It could be, they just cannot get on because one cat constantly tries to get the other one or, um, or I'm not sure how it's really going in, in your home. But if she's not even confident enough to go into the same room, then you're gonna have a really high uphill battle on your hands. Hopefully you can still make it work. Um, but to get off the starting line, I would just, as I say, use distractions and distance as much as you can. So have the cat, the new cat, as far away from your resident cat as you can with someone, with some treats, so that that cat's having a nice time. Um, and then see if you can sort of edge her in or lure her in with some food. Um, or some cats just like attention. Like my cat will, if I sat on the floor, he would just come over naturally. So um, think about what, what works for her. What, what could you use that would entice her in? And then just do it in the least pressure way as you can to so keep them as, as far apart as you possibly could and then you could start building up from there. Um, but it's not easy and I'm sorry because with you I've just said all that as if it's easy. I know it isn't and I know loads of times when I work with people to do this it doesn't work. It's not like yeah I can come in and I can sort all that because sometimes we can and lots of times we can which is amazing but there are times when it's just not working out so I really hope that's not the case for you and I definitely don't feel on the face of it that it is um but it is something to bear in mind that if it's actually i'm not going to talk about your cats karen but generally it's probably worth mentioning here that if your cats really 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 don't get on and they're miserable like i see loads of times when i go into people's houses and i think oh those poor cats are actually miserable then um actually finding them a new home is sometimes best for everyone like this cat some cats want to be cats with a house of their own um i just quoted mog there accidentally <laughs> My kids like board book mog. Um, some cats like to be cats with a house of their own, um, and that's true. So, um, so putting them in separate houses, both cats might be like, oh, okay, good, I can get on with the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, but Karen, if you wanted to chat in more detail, then do get in touch. Um, I've got other bits and bobs around videos and vlogs that might be helpful, but I'd be happy to point you in the right direction or um, book a consultation if you wanted to go down that road as well. Um, but I'm going to leave it there for today. But thanks for everyone for coming along and for all your questions. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, but likewise, if you have any other questions, let me know because I might, maybe we could do another one if you've still got questions and then we can get them answered as well. Um, but have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Bye.